your name, where you're from, and why you're here today. We're going to kick off in just a moment. So, dear friends, dear comrades, dear family, thank you for saying yes to the invitation to join us today. We're here to engage in a conversation with renowned Sikh activist, author, civil rights lawyer, Valerie Kaur, to explore revolutionary love, in particular in these profound times. We will also be blessed with the sound and wisdom nuggets of my dear brother and collaborator, Zoe Toby, who even birthed a song for this occasion. Uh, this conversation is hosted by Thrive East Bay, a community based in Oakland, which many of you are a part. We gather folks at the intersections of meaning, belonging, arts, and social change. And this conversation is one of many in a series that we're calling Medicine for These Times, with the intention of nourishing our bodies, our hearts, our minds, and spirits as we navigate the complexity, the pain, the rupture of this moment, as well as the profound opportunity and uh, potential. So before we actually pass the mic to Zoe to open us in Heartful Song, I wanna just take a moment to acknowledge the land that I am on and invite each of you to acknowledge the land that you are on, recognizing the centuries of colonization, oppression and, and impact uh, I am on the unceded Huichin territory of Chichenyo Ohlone people, also known as the East Bay in California. I share this to acknowledge the theft of land and the harm of white settler, settler colonialism, as well as to include the guidance of indigenous people for how we might come into right relationship with where we live and where we work. I want to acknowledge that though naming this is important, it's not enough to write the harms of our past and want to encourage all of us to support indigenous movements for self-determination in these times. To find out the native land you are on, uh, please check out the links in the chat box. And if you live in the Bay, I want to encourage you all to check out the Segorite Land Trust where you can make a contribution to this indigenous women-led trust that is a source of deep inspiration for these times. You can find out more about that in the chat box too. So with that, I want to just invite a collective breath to ground us on our land, in this space, with each other. Exhale wherever you are. And let's take a moment to breathe in together. <sighs> and release whatever might be in your way of presence. And give yourself full permission to be here. to be in this moment, in this deeply profound moment. This moment where we are all awake to the extraordinary harm on black bodies in particular, loss of life in the center of the public conversation, the recent shooting of Jacob Blake in front of his babies, the killings of George Floyd, Dijon Kizzy, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Maude Arbery, Richard Brooks, too many other black lives harmed and lost to police brutality and structural racism to name. Months into the largest uprising for racial and economic justice we've seen in the United States for literally decades. Systemic racism increasingly a part of our mainstream lexicon. Months into the COVID crisis, and its disproportionate impact on black and brown communities. The social isolation that I know many of us are experiencing, the financial uncertainty, food and housing insecurity, loneliness, confusion, fear. And then add to that the climate disaster all around us, hurricanes in the east, fires in the west. My children couldn't go to school today because the air is black. We're in a moment of deep rupture some might call it collapse. Valerie urges us to ask, are we in the darkness of the tomb or the darkness of the womb? And that's the question we're going to inquire into together today. 
and into her potent call for revolutionary love. So with that foundation laid, I want to introduce you all again to my brother Zoe Toby, who I've known for many, many years. He's been a comrade in the, in the struggle for justice and brings forth for me the most important medicine of these times, music. Uh, he's a maker, uh, a song birther of purpose-driven rock to support our collective purpose, reverence, social action. People who love Zoe's music call it medicine for the soul. He reminds us of who we really are in our most awake moments. Uh, and his work, his, his music for me has been a source of remembering, of awakening, of connection to myself and to, to the larger we, to the larger web of which we're all a part. So, so grateful to have you with us here today, Zoe. And wanna uh, invite you to open us in song. Thank you, Shireen. Uh, we all need someone in our lives like Shireen is for me. Uh, so I'm going to start us off with a song that really the credit goes to Valerie. Uh, if you've seen her speech from New Year's Eve 2016 at AME Church, uh, some of these words will be familiar to you. And if you haven't seen it, I urge you to go see it. And uh, my heart is pounding and about to leap out of my chest. So here we go. This is called Breathe and Push. And thank you all so much for tuning in for this, this night. You who are breathless from a world in you who feel like your chest is going to cave What if this weakness were only felt by the brave Who turn to the darkness with eyes wide awake And what if all this darkness is not of the tomb. And what if all this darkness is the darkness of the room? Then we've got to breathe and push. Oh, breathe and push, push, push. Oh, breathe and push. Oh, breathe and push, push, push. We who are children, we who have dreams, we with ancestors in our ear still whispering they're whispering what if this pain now is not of the end but a water that's breaking for something waiting to begin and what if all this darkness is not of the tomb. And what if all this darkness is the darkness of the world? Then we've got to breathe and push. Oh, breathe and push, push, push. Oh, breathe and push. Oh, breathe and push, push, push. You and I labor, we labor in love, love, love. 
and I labor, we labor in love. You and I labor, we labor in love, love, love. You and I labor, we labor in love, love, love. I know you are trembling. I know you are scared. I know you feel it coming. The contraction is here. We'll brave it together. The flood and the fire. Just always remember your wisdom calling from inside, saying, Breathe and push. Oh, breathe and push, push, push. Oh, breathe and push. Breathe and push, push, push. Oh, breathe and push. Oh, breathe and push, push, push. Oh, breathe and push. Oh, breathe. Push, push, push. Can we all just take a breath and take that in? Wow, so move to my core. Thank you. Thank you, Got brother. <laughs> Valerie, you're welcome to respond. <laughs> I've never cried so much. <laughs> the beginning of a webinar. I don't, you've undone me. You just, thank you. Thank you. Um, those words, those words, it, it, is this the darkness of the tomb or of the womb? Breathe and push. It's, it's like you, you took those words and then you worked your alchemy and your magic to, to give them back to me so that I could hear them anew. And this is why I think I was weeping. <laughs> it felt like, um, oh, like nourishment from the inside. Like my heart is beating fast and I feel a kind of rising. I feel like an ache. And I also feel that rising energy of knowing that, oh, we are not alone and we are in this together. And so I thank you brother for returning me. <laughs> You're so welcome. And I get to witness. <laughs> it's incredible what happens when we uh, when we bridge our magic together. What more becomes possible? Yes. So deep gratitude to both of you. That that was clearly a collaboration, <laughs> <laughs> profound collaboration. Um, thank you so much. So we will be summoning upon your magic again uh, at the later part of our our time together. Deep bow. <laughs> Gratitude. Thank you so much, Shireen. Thanks, everybody. And uh, I'm going to be listening along with you. So we're in for a treat. <laughs> yeah, please feel free, y'all, to share some deep love and appreciation with Zoe in the chat. Ooh. I think we can be done. I think he said it all. <laughs> the song was the container, right, for everything that you're feeling. Like, that. that is what we need to be led by the kind of bravery to face how painful it is instead of be numb to it, just let it, just feel it. And then even inside of that, to summon our courage to breathe and then to push. I think that's probably the most vital, essential thing that we can do for each other right now. So I'll stay, but I just say more. Say, say more, Valerie. <laughs> I want to I want to offer a proper introduction. I, I imagine that most folks who are here are here because they know who you are. But I want to just uh, acknowledge the incredible journey you've been on to, to to arrive to this moment as we launch into this conversation and deepen in our inquiry of breath and pushing. Um, so, 
Y'all, it's such a deep honor to have Valerie Kaur with us right now. From that video that went viral, that quote that took on a life of its own that has been such a source of hope, possibility, framing of this moment for so many of us. Uh, if you have not yet had a chance to read her book, I cannot recommend it enough, See No Stranger. Her story starts, you know, generations ago, before she was even born. So profound, uh, the trajectory she's been on. To, to be the prophetic voice, to call forth the prophetic voice that she offers us in this moment. Center for American Progress framed Valerie as uh, a prophetic voice at the forefront of progressive change. And it was this video that Zoe spoke to that I'm speaking to that really catalyzed, brought her on to the global stage with more than 30 million views worldwide. This question of, are we in the darkness of the tomb or the darkness of the womb, reframed the political moment and really became a mantra, a mantra for all of us. And now Valerie leads the Revolutionary Love Project. We're gonna do a lot more of a deep dive into understanding what she means by revolutionary love. She's been a contributor and commentator on MSNBC, CNN, NPR, PBS. The list goes on. Uh, she has earned her degrees at Stanford, Harvard Divinity School, and she's also a lawyer. She brings so many threads of wisdom, bridges so many worlds, and uh, we're super blessed to have you with our community and helping us make meaning out of these times and figuring out how we can be a catalyst for uh, midwifing the new world that our hearts are so deeply longing for. So thank you for your yes, Valerie. Thank and I you. To, yeah. My name is Shireen, by the way, and I uh, just feel really honored to be a host of this conversation on uh, representing uh, my beloved community Friday's Day. So I want to kick us off, Valerie, by just inviting you to share a little bit about how you're managing in these times and what kind of meaning you're making out of this moment that we're inside of right now. Are we in the darkness of the tomb? Are we in the darkness of the womb? What's alive for you in this moment? In this moment, my children are downstairs, <laughs> five and one. My husband is putting food into their bodies, I hope, having dinner. I'm hoping they won't burst through the door. I see, hear someone gardening next door. <laughs> so I'm in this um, moment where everything feels impossible. You know, to show up with our best selves to mother with all that our children need right now and to show up to the movement and to the country right now and to do it amidst pandemic where we have less support and financial strain and so much of our country and our state is literally on fire if not metaphorically it feels impossible it feels breathless and so i think what you did at the top of this call shireen was name all that we are facing and grieving it's like you you offered a portrait of the darkness of the tomb and this question that I have been asking myself, I ask myself every day, which one is it? And in all honesty, I've come to conclude that it is both. It is both the tomb and the womb when more than 180,000 people have been killed by a virus whose scale and scope was preventable had we had competent leadership. A virus disproportionately killing people of color. When we think of George and Brianna and the list goes on, as you say, we know that we'll never get those lives back. When we, when we see that this administration has been responding to this revolutionary moment of, of uprising that we're in with actions that can only look like authoritarianism, snatching people off the streets of Portland, stuffing them into unidentified vehicles, militarizing our neighborhoods in response to cries for racial justice. It is the darkness of the tomb. Our America, or at least the America that we thought we were, has died for many of us. And yet, and yet I am seeing glimpses now, like never before of the kind of beloved community that we are striving to be. Shereen, for about a week after George Floyd's murder, my little neighborhood in Los Angeles became militarized. There were National Guard in the street, in front of my son's preschool, in front of the cafes where I wrote so much of this book, helicopters shaking the house day and night, we didn't leave. And I was less afraid of protests in the streets than I was of 
the military, uh, the militarized, um, we have brown children, small brown children, were we safe? And finally, after about a week, we ventured out and we were driving and I was so afraid that I would have to ex explain to my five-year-old uh, the men with the assault rifles and the assault vehicles. How, how, how was I going to explain that at five? And he was looking out the window and then his eye line fell on plywood boarding up stores and shops on Abbot Kinney, a street here in Venice. And I, re I followed his eyeline and I realized that he was looking at this beautiful public art that had emerged and big, beautiful portraits of George and Tamir and Brianna Taylor and Trayvon and BLMs with hearts everywhere. And he looked at me and said, Mommy, did you do that? <laughs> Because all he hears yeah. me talk about is love and justice and revolutionary <laughs> love, and he sees the fist, and he sees the heart. Says, "Mommy, did you do that?" And I said, "God, they know. Like, we did that. These these convictions that we are holding around love and justice. There are millions of people. We saw a summer where millions of us were risking their own lives to flood the streets in our grief, in our rage, to rise up for Black lives and for racial justice. In a moment, I honestly never thought I would see in my lifetime." It has touched every corner of this country, every industry, every institution, and we're still experiencing, con you know, a continuation of that. So, when I see an army of a wall of white people in front of black people kneeling in the street in front of an army of police officers, I know that I have never seen those images before not in 1968, not in 1992, that never before have so many of us, white people and non-black people of color stood up with our black sisters and brothers, joined arms, these acts of solidarity, this grieving together, this raging together, this rising together, this is revolutionary love. And if, if, if we can stay in the labor, stay in the labor long enough, not just between now and the election, but past the election to keep grieving and pushing to have Zoe's song play in us, so that we have the energy to keep breathing and pushing, might we, might we birth a nation that is longing to be, might we finally birth an anti-racist society, a beloved community, the America that we dream. And so I stay in the labor for that vision. And that's when I choose to see the darkness of the womb. And when I fail, it's people like Zoe and people like you who would turn me to that vision and say, oh, my love, stay. Stay, let's breathe together and let's push together. Can you talk more about breathing and pushing? <laughs> what does it look like to breathe together? What does it look like to push together? Didn't we just feel it? That was when a Zoe was When Zoe that was, was that was the deepest breath I had taken all day. And notice when we take that deep of a breath together, we become aware of all the parts of us that we have pushed away, like the grief started to rise and my, my eyes started to tear up and a little bit of the rage I could feel like a spark inside of me and then this ever rising joy I could feel in me too and knowing that we were together inside of this, that that's what breathing looks like for me now. We know it when we feel it, when we take moments between the pushes to drop in, to be present with one another and to gather some strength and bravery from each other. And even in those moments when I'm not in community, to summon ancestors who make me brave. I think all of us, whether we're with people or by ourselves, can take those moments to drop in, to gather strength, to breathe, and then to push like never before. Between now and the election, we have a massive push ahead of us. We have an election that is not just about, not even about ideas on the left or the right. This election is about democracy versus authoritarianism on our soil. Never before has so much been at stake, and you named it, with climate change on the horizon. We, we know that this election is, is not even just about our country, but, but about the future of the earth, and therefore the future of the human race, there is so much at stake and 
What does it mean for us not to give in to despair or cynicism, but to believe that we have a role to play, that each and every one of us has a distinct and singular role to play, that pushing means to lean into uncomfortable sensations, an uncomfortable territory, places that we have never pushed ourselves before, to stretch ourselves, to push with all our might for what we want to birth. And it begins with the election. It's not the culmination, it's the beginning, but only if all of us show up. Can you say more? Because obviously in our movements, there's a, there's a lot of dissonance around kind of the choices in this election more generally. And I believe I saw somewhere in um, learning more about your lens right now, you framed the election almost as an act of love. Together we can reclaim the vote as an act of love. How do you feel about the choices at hand right now? And in particular for folks who are wanting a more radical uh, transformation in our electoral politics, how, would, how, do you, how do you address that very valid and legitimate concern? I, I wanted that too. I, I wanted candidates who could really lead into the most expansive vision of what we could be, who we could be, how we could be. And yet I have come out with my whole heart, all of me to endorse the Biden Paris ticket. And the reason is this, I believe that putting them in power would give us a window of opportunity for the rest of us to keep laboring, to push not only progressive policies and um, actions that would take on our institutions of power so that they, that they would be, be truly um, institutions that value each and every one of us, it would give us a chance to do that work block by block too. And I think too many of us, I, I count myself among them, you know, we saw Obama's election in 08 as the the end of white supremacy <laughs> instead of our first real opportunity to dismantle it too many of us celebrated and we went home and as a result we we lost our chance we missed our opportunity if we had stayed vigilant if we had stayed organized might we have been able to push push the administration push our elected leaders to birth the kind of america that we know that we needed instead of leaving it just to them so I think we are wiser now. I think we are sober now. I think I, I think that we know that, that that kind of change comes from the bottom up. And we ourselves are different. We ourselves are different now. And so that's why I, I, I believe in the breathing and pushing because it, it allows for longevity. That after this election, we, we breathe. And hopefully, if we have Biden-Harris in power, we begin the long and arduous an essential labor for the America that that we want, where we see no stranger. <laughs> well, we can't even hearing, have that chance unless we. Right. <laughs> I'm also hearing what you're saying, more. and and I think about my own labor. You know, one of the things that you, Zoe, and I all have in common is that we've all had babies in the last couple of years. So it's a very, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very um, compelling metaphor for me, and I just. Uh, I'm so in touch with the journey of the contractions, the different kinds of pushing. And I'm curious how you might draw that metaphor forward. So working, ensuring that this election goes to Biden-Harris, one kind of push, how else do we push? I yeah. In your book, I remember reading this, uh, the role of Johnson, the role of King, you know, different kinds of pushing. How, how do we call upon the many wisdoms, skill sets, uh, areas of passion in our broader community to push in different ways. And what does it look like for all of us to have a role in that midwifing, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, there's a story in See No Stranger about a professor who holds up two images to her classroom, one of Lyndon Johnson and the other of Dr. King. And she asks her classroom after Obama is elected, which one is Obama? And they all say, King, King, King. And she says, no, 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 Obama is Johnson. He is constrained by the limitations of the presidency. Johnson needed King in order to enact the civil rights victories that we saw in that era. The president needs a King. The president needs Kings in the plural. We can be those Kings. So what does it mean for all of us now? I see so many people who never before are you know, holding up signs, Black Lives Matter and 
are, re are calling for us to reimagine policing as we know it in this country, to reimagine public safety as we know it, to reimagine criminal justice as we know it. And all of those larger reforms require the, the courage of elected leaders and the ability for us to push those elected leaders to make those reforms. So that's one kind of push. But then I think about how those folks, when they come off the streets, then go back into their families, into their homes, into their workplaces, into their houses of worship, into their industries. There is no institution in this country that does not need you right now to transition it into being a truly anti-racist institution. So each of us, it may feel small, but it's like my kid's school. <laughs> you know, how, how do we make sure that education is um, offering our children the tools to see no stranger, to become equipped to not just know each other, but wonder about each other and grieve with each other and fight for each other when we're in harm's way? How do we teach them racial justice? Thinking about industries, you know, thinking about the fact that drive was created as a beloved community for so many who were not seeing it in their institutions, in their, in their houses of worship. How can we create alternative spaces that embody those deep values? There are many kinds of ways to push, and, and it begins really with looking at those institutions carefully. All the institutions that you move into and out of in the course of your life, physically before this pandemic, virtually now after this pandemic, all the institutions that you touch, which ones are obsolete? Which ones can be reformed? And which ones need to be reimagined? Which ones need to be dismantled so that you can create something new in their stead? And my metric for deciding, to, for answering those questions, is the institution, is, is, the, is the best version of this institution an institution that could honor the dignity and the wellness of everyone who interacts with it. And if it cannot, then it needs to be dismantled. So I look at prisons and I look at um, the criminal justice system and I know that to be true about it. When it's, it's very foundation is punishment, then we need to reimagine it entirely so that it's foundation is rehabilitation and restoration. But when I think about like my kid's school, for example, <laughs> I know that the best version of it is something that gives life to even children who look like mine. So how can I help it transition? How can I help it become reformed? And so I, I, I think that's what the labor looks like. And it is not glamorous. It's not, it's gritty and it's Messy. serious. It hurts. It's block by block in neighborhoods. <laughs> like, it's, it's so, and the reason I think that everyone has a role and everyone needs to live into the role is because the kind of unrest that we're experiencing in this country right now, this, this fiery moment that we are in I believe that it's part of a much larger transition stage that we are in as a nation. Within 25 years, the number of people of color will exceed the number of white people for the first time since colonization on the soil. And so we, we are at a crossroads. No matter who is in the White House, will we continue to descend into a kind of civil war, a power struggle with those who wanna return the country to a past where a certain class of white people hold dominion? Or will we begin to birth a nation that has never been, never been a nation made up of other nations on this planet, a nation that is truly multiracial, multi-faith, multicultural, where power is shared, where we strive to protect the dignity, dignity and wellness of, our, of every person. So Valerie, that last point, protect the dignity and wellness of every person, in particular in this time of deep polarization, fear, um, contraction, constriction. Can you talk about this notion of revolutionary love and how it can support us in transcending our partisan reality, our othering reality? Even I think folks holding this beautiful vision that you just articulated, there's still an othering that happens of folks who are, who are uh, resisting that, who are uh, not supporting our collective freedom, liberation struggle. How do we welcome them into our circle of concern as well so that we're actually embodying the values that we're espousing in the work? Yes, how do we love our opponents? How do we love our opponents? 
I want to say first that if you are someone who has a knee on their neck right now, like so many black people and brown people do in this moment, if you have a knee on your neck, it is not necessarily your role in this moment to look up at your opponent and try to wonder about them or listen to them or love them. Your job is to stay alive. Your job is to take the next breath. Your job is to love yourself enough to want to last. That's your revolutionary act. But if you are someone by virtue of your white skin or the privilege that you wield, if you find yourself safe enough and brave enough to wonder about those kinds of opponents, then we need you now. We need you to sit with them and hear their story and tend their wound and help them transition. Because here, here's what I know to be true. And you, you, you read this book. This book is filled with stories of me um, sitting with white supremacists, sitting with people who have murdered members of my community, sitting with police officers and prison guards and former abusers. And every time I want to hate them, every time I want to leave because what they're saying is so infuriating, I stay, I return to wonder. You have a story and I need to hear it. And it happens, Shereen, it always happens. There's a moment beneath the slogans and the sound bites that I begin to hear their story. And then I begin to feel their pain. And I begin to see their wound. Their suffering is, is not equivalent to mine, no, but there is, the participation in oppression comes at a cost. It cuts them off from their own capacity to love. And, and I have come to, to understand that there are no such thing as mon monsters in this world. There are only human beings who are wounded, who do what they do out of their own sense of insecurity or greed or blindness. And so what does it mean to tend to their wound? I have found that so many disaffected white people in the country today, the white supremacist violence that we are seeing, that enormous aggression comes from unresolved grief. They are grieving the notion that this country ever belonged just to them in the first place. It may not be my job <laughs> to help them in that grieving process, but it needs to be somebody's. Because the day after the election, even if we have a Biden-Harris victory, all those folks are still gonna be there. And we are anticipating violence in the streets, especially if this election, the results are disputed. I mean, we, we know that each of us has a different role in the labor. And what I'm so ignited by is that there are so many white people who are in the movement now with us like never before, who can do the labor that we can't, mm -hmm. who can be the accomplices. And so I think so much about this moment about you asking like, how do we push is about discerning your particular role in the community and the movement and where you can bring your energy and your attention and your love. I'm thinking of a, a dear brother of mine, um, Kazu Haga, who some folks know, um, who just posted a pretty brave um, statement, essentially offering some compassion, wonder, and curiosity toward Kyle Ritten, Rittenhouse, is that his name? Mm -hmm. um, the man in Kenosha who killed two people, the 17-year-old white boy who killed two people and, and shot and harmed a third. And um, there was a lot of backlash toward my brother for his attempt at wondering and, and just framing up. The, the poison of our society in this time. And I'm, I'm curious, Valerie, how you as such a deep holder of revolutionary love, just what's the message for the movement and the ways that we're trying to call each other in and out and the harm that happens inside of our spaces where we're really in solidarity and working toward a similar goal, but in our attempts to do some of the bridging, repair, humanizing of the other, um, actually create more harm inadvertently. Missing. Yeah. Uh, first, I, I hope that you can say to your brother that this call to love without limit, this revolutionary love has never been popular in any era of human history. If you think back thousands of years, all the social reformers, all the martyrs, all the spiritual teachers, it's never been popular. It's always been hard. And in this moment, I think the call to wonder and love about people like that 
people take that approach as if it is um, weak or gives them a pass or doesn't hold them accountable. And that's just a fallacy that it is possible to hold our opponents accountable and still see them as wounded human beings. And I want to offer that this call to love one's opponents, to humanize one's opponents, doesn't just preserve their humanity, it preserves our own because we, not, we cannot become what we're fighting against. We, so, and this is why my, the case that I wanna to make to the movement, to activists in particular, is that this act of loving one's opponents is not just moral, it is strategic. Because if I see that 17 year old, not as a monster, but as a 17 year old, and I can hear his story and listen to him, even him, then I can ask myself, who radicalized him? What radio programs were, was he listening to? What, who put the guns in his hands? What groups was he a part of? What, what pieces of the president's statements were the ones that drove him to take violence into the streets? And that makes me a more effective activist. I am invested in unseating this president, but I am more invested in un and, and changing the conditions that put him into power in the first place. And I have found that any time in all the campaigns I've worked on, any time we went after bad actors, we put police officers behind bars, but we never actually created lasting change. Lasting change comes from transforming the institutions of power that radicalize those opponents and authorize those opponents and allow them to keep harming us. So it's the institutions that need to be transformed so that a 17-year-old like Kyle can be liberated from them too. So you bring together the legal dimension, the spiritual dimension, just your story as being a brown girl growing up in rural California. <laughs> um, I feel so touched just in, for me, the truth of, of, of uh, but the pain of, com of reckoning with that truth of our shared humanity and also just how hard it is, especially knowing oh. yeah. the excruciating pain, loss and centuries of, of oppression, trauma, devastation that folks are carrying. Um, it's just, it's so, complex and I, I it for me calls forth what is my role to play inside of this you know yes. as, yeah yeah and I, I, also, I, really and I just come back to that right because it may not be the role of so many of us to do that wondering for Kyle but your brother had the capacity to do it was safe enough brave enough to do it and my role is to say please do that work that I can't do right now yeah yeah you couple in your writing uh, rage and love. You talk about the first step to loving our opponents is rage. Can you elaborate on that for us? As a, as a South Asian American woman, I had just swallowed the lie for so much of my life that the opposite of love was rage that I was only as good or polite or loving as my ability to choke down my anger. And I learned very quickly that it was actually after I told the story and, and seen a stranger, like many women surviving in a, a sexual assault and breaking my silence among my extended family. And it was my mother who stood, I was breaking the unwritten rule in the sky, right? Silence is survival. And it was my mother who stood between me and the rest and said, not my daughter, she will be free. And she had a rage warring in her that I had never seen before in my life. <laughs> she was showing me that rage is the force that protects that which we love and that I was worth protecting, that my body was worth protecting. And she was showing me how to have that kind of rage for myself, that rage is a healthy and necessary and essential way to process trauma. And I think so many women and girls have been taught to choke down their rage. And in the meantime, so many men and boys have been taught to let it explode. <laughs> and the solution is neither, right? The solution is to allow your rage to rise through you like energy without shame, without guilt, and then process it in safe containers. So 
weeping and throwing pillows to the ground and art and music and dance and um, rituals of all kinds. I mean, indigenous communities know this, that we need containers to process of hard emotions like grief and like rage. And once we do that, then it creates a little bit of spaciousness to look at, again at our opponents and ask, how can we reorder the world so that they don't continue to harm us? And this I call divine rage. That the aim of divine rage is not vengeance, it is to reorder the world. And it's focused fury, like from the goddess, the forehead of the goddess, the, in, in Hindu tradition, the Kali is the fiercest form of the goddess, goddess Durga, and she was formed by the concentration of fury in Durga's head. And she emerged and she is, her tongue is rolling out, drinking the blood of life. She has a necklace of garland. She is fierce and fiery, but she's revered as the, a divine mother because she protects us with her love. Her love protects us. How, how can we, <laughs> I, I find that it's like a dance now, Shireen. How can, I, how can I release my raw rage in safe containers so that I can harness my divine rage in my words, in, in my marching, in my writing, in my speaking, in, in my art making, in my activism, and let that fuel me for creative action. And don't we need that now? And there's so much to make us so enraged. So work much. With, work with it like a dance. And I feel if we don't create those containers for our rage to actually come to loving our opponent won't be possible. We need a container for our rage. We need to be yes. helped and witnessed in our rage. Yeah. Yes. Yes, because I, I, I find that when I suppress my rage, it hardens into hate. And then I can never, I just hate my opponent. I'm carrying that burden inside of me. But when I am we're able to, to process rage, it, create, it creates a bit of spaciousness. So then in the next breath, I can wonder. I can return to wonder again. And, and that's why I believe that um, raging in order to arrive at wondering again is the way that we practice loving our opponents. Beautiful. And I also love this inquiry inside of our rage when we're deeply in touch with the fire in our bellies of what, what am I trying to protect? What is this rage? what wisdom can it offer me around what I deeply love and stand for in the world? It's such a beautiful flip of that powerful energy. And if yeah. we actually sh shift our, our anger at our othering toward, toward what am I deeply standing for? My love for justice, yeah. my love for humanity, my love for whatever it may be, our planet, powerful. Yes, it was, it was black feminist Audre Lorde, I mean, I, I, so many black thinkers have influenced the way that I think about love and justice, the relationship between the two in this book. And it's black feminists in particular, like Audre Lorde, who calls us to think about our anger loaded with information and energy. Mm. He asks us to listen to it like a symphony. Right? And when I think about that, then it's like, oh, if I'm processing my rage and then I can be in relationship to it, I can ask, what is it telling me? And like you're naming, what, what, do, what, am I, what am I standing for? And if I'm standing for humanity, then I can't create a circle that leaves my opponents out. <laughs> and I have to be like this expansive and what do I need to be able to be that brave to do that? So yes, that's it. That's Beautiful. it. But I really find that I can't do this by myself. I need others to help me. Like I need midwives. <laughs> Absolutely, and mirrors and sisters in the struggle. Yeah. I'm also just struck now, Valerie, in hearing you speak about how you are, how you're, how you're Papa G. You're doing the work of your ancestors. You're just, and, and you're, you're, you've evolved it to the, to meet this moment. It's just so moving. I just, I, I see your ancestors at your back saying, yes, my love, go forth. It's just so beautiful. It's moving. Um, Speaking of ancestors and future ones, I would really love to hear you talk uh, as, a, as a relatively new youngish mom myself, how you're navigating um, both being a mama, just literally like, what do you tell your babies about the stories of what's happening in our streets right now? I'm just like grappling with that with my six year old and, and just the way, you know, she hears the news and the story of the knee on the neck and eight minutes and 46 seconds and mommy, what does this mean? And how, how do you grapple with um, sharing what's so and also protecting your children and giving them a sense of what's possible for the future? That piece of motherhood and then also just the unbelievable energy it is that is required to parent, especially in this isolated time and you're still kicking ass in the world. Like, how do you do it? <laughs> um, you 
probably know more about this than I do at this point because my son is five and a half and uh, he doesn't know George Floyd or Neon Neck. And so how did you navigate that conversation with your daughter? And then I promise I'll say more, but I I actually really want to know for myself. (laughs) I don't know if I did it well. I mean, I really grapple with this question, especially knowing that, um, especially my my black and brown brothers and sisters who are not in the bubble of privilege that I find myself, like there's no choice about how to have this conversation or when to have this conversation on some level. I am of the, I follow her lead where she expresses curiosity or asks questions. I try to be as clear and honest with her as possible, share just so much. And if she continues to probe and inquire, share just a little bit more. I think she's really confused about it because her world is filled with love. We have a deeply diverse community of multi-generational, multicultural and it's just so counter to what her experience of the world is to think that that kind of um, harm and meanness and racism, um, she doesn't see that in her immediate circle. So helping her navigate between the world that is hers and the world that we are aspiring toward and struggling for together and the very real reality of other parts of our world that she doesn't see, is it's a challenge for me. But I would say ultimately my answer is letting Zahara lead and doing my best. And I think it's been a deep message to me around how spongy our babies are and needing to be much more discerning and mindful about what program, what news program is on in the background when she's in the room, because she listens and she understands and she asks. Shereen, I'm taking notes. I think following her lead is exactly right. I think that I invite you, sister, not to feel any guilt about letting beloved community be your daughter's primary experience, foundational experience in life. That if she has a multiracial community around her and there is harmony and wellness and dignity, then you are embodying the kind of world that we want for every single one of us. And she, you are giving her a felt sense of what beloved community feels like, looks like is like in her body and that means it can be a reference point for her as she begins to navigate more and more of the world (laughs) that's that's how it is i think all of us have had a moment where some for some of us it's just a sliver and for some of us it's a season of life where it's like oh this is what this is what it could be to be held in harmony and for too many brown and black children It's not, it's so faint, that sliver, because too soon. My first racial slur was at six years old. My son's first racial slur was at four years old. We've had to explain race and racism in the summer at a time when we felt like it was too early and yet here he is following his lead means to start to try to offer him what we know about it in a way that he can understand and in just pieces that he can take in. And so it is messy and it is treacherous and there is no perfect, there is no perfect. But I, I do think that one thing we've done in this house we, is we don't have the news, we don't say the name of the president, we don't have uh, radio or television playing and I've really invested in that idea of letting, because I ha- we have to do, be extra vigilant around it, right? As a, as a Brown, as a sick family, we had to, to, to purposely create beloved community around my son and let that be his his first memories. And so far cruelty has been on the periphery. And pretty soon it'll be more and more hit the landscape of the world. And so letting him let that in when he's ready, when he sees it, and that those first conversations happen when he saw the murals and we had to talk about who black people are and what it means to be, what it means to love them. <laughs> so we start there, we start there and we go on, but it's it's really these conversations I'm having with my husband every night at the kitchen table. So also just in the laboring over it and the wrestling over it, you're not alone. Yeah, there's no precedent. It's just like no. so deeply longing for our mentors, our elders to help us fumble through this time. <laughs> Incredible. 
Yeah. And what about the load? How do you navigate your deep commitment? And there's also a breathe and push inside of that, right? It's like, how do you navigate showing up for your family, showing, embodying the world that you're aspiring to create in the, in the now while also working toward it? It's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard. <laughs> you know, one, it's five and one. So like both really high needs and totally different needs. Like I'm nursing one baby and then trying to, you know, teach my son why the sky is blue to answer his question. I mean, it's just so different. And one wakes up at 530 in the morning, the other goes to sleep at 9 p.m. It's just like nonstop labor and the child care support fell from under us. So it, it, it's been so hard. It's felt really impossible, like so many mothers and then I think about you know families of color navigating pandemic on top of all all of, of the uprisings we're seeing and, and trying to explain and trying to do both and it, it's it's just so hard and this is where the breathing and pushing has been just a month rough for my own daily life like before as an activist I would just push 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 thinking that if I just pushed hard enough and long enough and I was doing my best and now really forcing me like be having family and realizing that mothering is also frontline social justice work and I can't be my best as an activist or as a mother if I'm not breathing throughout the day. And so what does that breathing look like? I mean, I, I poured myself a hot cup of tea before our conversation, took a deep breath, listening, dropping into Zoe's song, taking a deep breath, trying to, I have a huge hot pink water bottle because I never drink enough water. The basics are so Thank you for the reminder. Sleeping eight hours a night. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so many people who don't even have access to the basics. So who am I if I'm not actually taking advantage of those basics so I can show up as my best self? For so long, I thought that serving meant to make yourself suffer, that you have to struggle with the communities you are serving and, and bleed with them. And there's an inevitable bleeding that happens when you're struggling with communities in harm's way. But I have come to believe that what we ought to be doing is living the life that we want for every single person on earth. Mm. Raising our children the way that we want every single children to, the child to feel. Not feeling guilty about it, but saying, if I can embody it, if I don't embody it, who else can? If I, if I, and if I'm embodying it, then I know it's possible. And how can I change the structures and institutions that make it impossible for other families? That, that's how I'm navigating it. One quote I captured from your book, the way we make change is just as important as the change we make, which feels deeply resonant and relevant there. Yes, yes, yes. If we're not making change, being led by love, then we're not actually creating change that lasts. And being led by sanity. I mean, the, the tendency in our social change cultures, I think so much is to just work and work and work and work and burn at both ends. And it's like, in a way, perpetuating some of the norms that we're trying to challenge, right? With our white supremacy culture still informing our movement spaces as we try to bird something new. So the sense and, of and urgency. We see, we see the result of that though, right? Like how many activists of color have gotten sick, have ended their lives, have opted out, have, have been killed. I mean, I think we need to model, especially as elders, like we need to model that the measure of your success is your longevity, your faithfulness to the labor, not the outburst, but the faithfulness to the labor over the years. Because transitioning this country is generational work. This is the work of our generation. So how can we teach them to last? And if we're not modeling it or embodying it, then they'll never believe us. So we have to show that we're not answering the email at four in the morning, that we're sleeping fully, that we're doing dance time every night. We, we have dance time in our house every night with the babies, no matter how dark or cruel or violent the day is, we dance, right? Yes! We have joy in. Yes. We have joy in. So I, I have come to believe that laboring for justice with joy is the meaning of life. Mm. Talk about sweet labor. Talk more about it. And were your births filled with sweet labor as well? Maybe that's too personal, but oh my goodness. Talk about sweet labor. <laughs> Did you encounter the ring of fire? And how did you find your way through that, literally and metaphorically? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so interesting when you're not all women, uh, so many women don't give birth. So many women don't give birth that particular way. But I have come to, I, I was thinking about this metaphor, how this birthing metaphor that we've been using. So let me just say something about that and then I'll talk about the specifics um, because I want everyone to see themselves in this metaphor. I think when we say warrior on or soldier on, we know what we mean. You know, it's the bravery to fight the good fight. Only a subset of mostly men through human history have had the actual experience of going to war, but we know what we mean, right? Show up, 
be brave, fight the good fight. So too, only a subset of women through history have had the physical embodied experience of giving birth that particular way. And yet there's a kind of wisdom in there that can be offered to all of us, the courage it takes to birth something new, to labor for one's family or one's movement or one's country. And the, the rhythm, the, the wisdom of the midwife is saying, oh my love, there is a rhythm to this kind of creation, right? It's you, but it's also the forces of nature that you're working with to birth something that hasn't been before and it requires breathing and it requires pushing and a kind of faithfulness and a kind of trust. So this is why I offer up the metaphor. And if we want to get really into it. I love <laughs> the metaphor. I mean, there's so many dimensions of the metaphor that are so deeply speak to me. Recognizing for me in that rite of passage, just the, 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 I was thinking of my mother and my mother's mother and my mother's mother's mother behind me. And when I think about our freedom struggles, the shoulders that we're standing on, mm -hmm. the sense of hopelessness, the sense of we're not going to make it push on, you can do it. You know, that just like standing on each other's shoulders and that sense of fear, like, I'm gonna die. I, in both of my births, I really thought I was gonna die. I, I, and, I, and, I, and I wanted to give up, you know? It just that, it's just, and seeing that in our movements, the sense of we're not gonna make it, let's just give up. So I feel that it's a genius metaphor and I love that it's a feminine led metaphor because we have so many masculine dominant metaphors in our lexicon. Great. We, we had very similar birth experiences. <laughs> like, I can't, I just the words, I can't. My mother was like, you are brave. Like, I can't. <laughs> and, that, and that's the thing, right? Who did you have by your side in those births? My mother, my partner, and a midwife in the first. And my mother wasn't with me in the second, but partner and midwife. Yeah. So and amazing. Do you need them? Wouldn't it, have, wouldn't it have been impossible without them? We need our mothers and our midwives. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so then we think about movements, right? In this moment when it's fiery and so painful and it feels like dying, who is by our side? Like who is whispering, who's, our, who's taking our hand? Who is whispering in our ear, you are brave? Who's maybe even making us laugh between the contractions? That's still possible, right? <laughs> They're making us cry. That feels important yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. And the, you know, when the ring of fire comes, my instinct the first time was to retreat, to pull back. It's not safe. Like, why would I, it was so counterintuitive. Like, why would I, why, why would I push into the flesh searing experience that this was? And no, the pushing requires you to lean into that kind of discomfort and to stretch yourself like never before, because on the other side lies the birth of new life. I feel that way about this election. I'm like, I can't, it hurts. I don't want to face the news. I don't want to call people to vote to, to inspire them or to because it's just so hard because it requires me to pull the deepest energy out of me. I don't have any left. And, you know, it's my sisters. It's my mother. It's like people like you who I'm meeting now who saying, oh, we need you, love. You can. You are brave. You are brave. Just breathe and then push and then breathe again. We so, yeah, I think everyone needs their midwives right now. <laughs> Um, there are some questions in the chat, and I'm sorry to all of the folks listening that I haven't been able to um, track the chat as carefully. I've been so, like, in my own experience of this conversation. Uh, <laughs> one that just emerged, would love to hear about your self-care and journaling practices. Mm. Oh, gosh. I, you know, I've kept a journal since the age of seven, and I would always just write the stories of my life. And so much, so many of the stories in this book are from going back and reading all those journals. So there's a lot of Specific, um, there, there's a lot of specificity. This is how I'm really tired. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we're with you. <laughs> very specific um, and, and, and truthful in this book because I, I did that practice for all of my life, but I don't think that was actually how I learned how to care for myself. Um, it's, it's a new practice, learning how to love myself. And it really, and I described this in the back of the book, at the end of the book, um, I, there's this little voice inside of me, that voice that says I can't on the birthing table. You know, you're not enough. You're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You don't have enough. Get small, you know, protect yourself. You're not brave enough. And I think that voice has, has been in me since the first racial slur, right? You're not human enough, you're less than. And my entire life, I think, has been this power struggle between the little critic, I call that voice the little critic, 
and the wise woman in me who says, oh, my love, you, you, you are enough. You are brave enough. It's my mother's voice. It's my ancestor's voice. And I've come to call that voice wise woman. Audre Lorde says we can learn how to mother ourselves. We can learn how to mother ourselves. So whereas before, if I had something that I needed, I would always go to other people. And we need other people. We need them in moments. But my final, my, my most precious self-care practice right now is getting quiet enough to let that wise woman in me speak to myself. And this really came into practice after my, my first son was born. I'd be like, oh, my love, you are so brave. You are so smart. You are so, he's a newborn. I'm like, you are so <laughs> And my look at me and say, why don't you speak to yourself that way? So I began this journaling practice. I, I have a journal, I call it my wise woman journal. And every day I write in this journal, wise woman here, wise woman says, and she always starts by telling me the state of my body. Oh, my love, you are tired today. Go, go and get a hot cup of tea before you begin your event. And just breathe through it. And it's okay if you stutter and stumble because what matters is showing up and being present. Let that be enough. <laughs> That's what she said to me just now. <laughs> Every day, throughout the day, laying down pathways in the brain, talking to myself with that kind of compassion and truthfulness and toughness, right? But always so tender. Listening to the wise woman in me is, is how I finally began to look myself. I just noticed how present tears have been with me throughout our entire conversation. It's like, for me, tears show up when there's truth. Tears and truth deeply accompany each other. So I just thank you, Valerie. Um, my parents were first generation immigrants in this country from East. I was born in North Carolina, like deep South, deep segregated South. And my earliest memory growing up was of being made fun of for my, uh, for the kofta, the delicious garlic filled kofta that looked like little turds that my mom used to pack me for lunch <laughs> in my kindergarten class. Oh. And I was called Turfro instead of Shireen for the first, until I was in seventh grade. I hated it. I, all I wanted was straight white girl hair that blew in the wind that I could like stick my fingers through. And I just had this big, I've come to love my beautiful mane as you all can see. But um, in our in our kind of closing chapter, I would love to hear a little bit more about self, the, the loving of self. We've talked about loving your opponent. We've alluded a little bit to loving of others. Can you talk a little bit more about how do we deepen in our love for ourselves? And I'm just so struck in the way that you just framed up the little voice in your head of I'm not brave enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not smart enough. I mean, here you are, like you have all the conventional degrees from all of the big shot universities. You've spoken on all these, you know, your, your friends are thought leaders in social change. You were among the thought leaders in, our, in leading our change movement and still these voices creep up. And that's, it's devastating to me. It's devastating to me. And I'm so curious about just the impact of oppression and just the architecture of our inner worlds. And yes. yet you have transcended and still there with you and you continue to transcend. I would love just to all of us on this call, how have you found your way to healing? What is your call to each of us in our own healing journey and how that will support our broader freedom and, and co-creation of the vision that we're midwifing together in the world? I find that the braver I get with my voice, the louder the little critic gets. The little critic, really, I see him as this like ragged bird like squawking in my ear. Every time I'm about to put out art into the world or step onto a stage, the little critic puffs up and says, this is my moment. It's a squawk, you know? And it was, it was um, my 35th birthday and my TED talk was about to be released on that day. And Which is brilliant, birthday. everybody should listen to it. <laughs> we'll put a link in the well, chat. <laughs> you know, here I am a lawyer and the, and, and, the, and the TED talk is called Revolutionary Love in a Time of Rage. And the little critic was like, they're gonna eat you alive. No one's going to take you seriously using the word love like that. I mean, it was just so oppressive. And, and then, you know, it, the thing about the voice of the wise woman is that it's quiet. And I have to get really quiet in order to listen to her. And then my whole life has been this, like, can I listen to the wise woman over the little critic? And, and finally, my 35th birthday, I decided no more power struggle. I'm going to banish the little critic forever. <laughs> I'm going to drown him. I mean, I can become violent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is oppression manifested Watch in, that, in my own mind. Yes. And it was the wise woman who said, oh, my love. You know, my, my, my invitation is to think of being able to look upon anyone and say, you are a part of me I do not yet know. 
And she was saying, that means everyone, even him. You are a part of me I do not yet know. We need this little guy around. We just don't need him in charge. You know, he's a part of you. We just don't need him in charge. So I um, created a ritual with my six sisters, with my girlfriends. We um, decided to honor the little critic and thank him for his years of faithful service because all this time I realized he was just trying to protect me. This world will eat up small brown women like you. So get small, what was his, what was his refrain? And so I could just be plunged in, into icy cold water and thanked him for his years of service and asked him to step aside. And in the meantime, I imagined a glistening throne room and I wanted, I invited a wise woman in me to take her place on the throne of my mind, my heart. And we thought the only way to capture this, <laughs> I was like, can I marry her? Can I be devoted to her for the rest of my days? So my sisters and I, we created a wedding ceremony, the Anankaraj in the Sikh faith, where we circle the scripture four times and every circle is like, a, 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 you're, you're supposed to uh, ascend to higher and higher states of consciousness of merging with the one. And I thought, what better to honor this commitment that I want to make to the wise woman. So I told her after we had this wedding ceremony, I, I saw her sit on the throne and I said, I will be faithful to you for the, all, the, all the days of my life. And I came home and I told my husband that I was married twice. <laughs> and he said, thank God. <laughs> wise woman makes my job so much easier. <laughs> So wow. that's it. That's it. The little critic comes and squawks and he's still around. But the difference is, is that he's not in charge anymore. Right. And my practice, I mean, I wish I could say it was all beautiful, perfect, no self doubt after that. But my practice has been turning to the wise woman and getting quiet enough to hear her. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna offer you this small segment from the book, because um, this is what I want to say to each of us. May I? Please. I believe that deep wisdom resides within each of us. Some call this voice by different sacred names, spirit, God, Jesus, Allah, Om, Buddha nature, Vaikuru. Others think of this voice as the intuition one hears when in a calm state of mind. Whatever name we choose, listening to our deepest wisdom requires discipline practice. The loudest voices in the world right now are ones running on the energy of fear, criticism, and cruelty. The voices we spend the most time listening to in the world and inside our own minds shape the way we see, how we feel, and what we do. When I spend time listening to people who are speaking from their deepest wisdom, I can feel understanding, inspiration, and energy nourish the root of my own wisdom. But I must not lose myself at the feet of others. My most vigilant spiritual practice is finding the seconds of solitude to get quiet enough to hear the wise woman in me. So beautiful. And may I say, Shireen, that being led by our wise women, our wise ones, it's not just how we last, it's how we transition into a beloved community. Wise woman tells me when to breed, when to push what my role is at any given moment, right? Imagine if a critical mass of us could be led by our deepest wisdom to show up. Oh, that, that, that is the kind of revolution yes. that is underway. That's what would allow for a revolution, isn't it? Can you talk a little bit, Valerie, about the intersection of, and your, your stories are alluding to it, but of, of your spirituality, your spiritual practice and social change? They're inseparable for me. My grandfather was the one who poured six stories and scriptures and songs in my ear from a young age. And anytime I felt distressed or sad or upset or, you know, in the wake of that first racial slur, it was climbing into his lap and letting him hold me and whisper in my ear, his favorite Shabbat, the hot winds cannot touch you, you are shielded by love. The model in the Sikh faith is the Sant Sipahi, 
the sage warrior or the warrior sage. The warrior fights, the sage loves. So it was a path of revolutionary love. And my grandfather, anytime I wanted to give up, right, the I can't, the little critic at a young age, he would always tell me, don't abandon your post. Don't abandon your post. I feel like my whole life since then has been this attempt to keep the promise I made to my grandfather. <laughs> I really feel that. Yeah, the Sikh faith is very unique in this way that um, we are called to nako veri nehi vagana. Nako veri nehi vagana. I see no enemy, I see no stranger. So if I see you as a brother or sister, then I must let your grief into my heart and I must be willing to fight for you if you are in harm's way. So that's how we became a warrior people. I mean, sword and shield fighting the good fight fighting for justice. And this is why I still love warrior metaphors, even as I'm pulling in birthing metaphors, because my grandfather was showing me that my sword could be my voice, my shield could be my camera, my law degree. All of us have swords and shields to fight the good fight now, right? And so in one moment, I'll use the, I need my fighting, in the other moment, I need my, I need my laboring, but <laughs> whatever you need in the, in, in the moment, um, I think our wisdom traditions have sources of of um, inspiration, of power, that we can lift up for a, a time like this. And what I love about what you're doing with Thrive is that you are creating a space where you are free enough to take what is serving you and let go of the rest that doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the kind of innovating and the kind of life-giving intervention, I think, that we need in our spiritual practices, marry the spiritual with the, the action that we so need. So this is why I had to say yes to being with you all. I think what you're doing is so amazing. I see you as a pocket of revolutionary love. <laughs> Thank you, Valerie, uh, for the affirmation reflection and also just for the gift of your life force. It's I've been energizing deeply, I think for all of us. I, one more question, just as we um, transition to a little bit more music. <sighs> and I, again, you painted the picture and this sense of um, the intersection of warrior and love, we talk about loving fiercely and thrive. What is the vision that you're birthing with your sweet labor and the vision that's just coming through you? What, as we move through the darkness of the womb, what's on the other side? Mm. So I, I believe that revolutions don't just happen in these big grand public moments. They happen where people are coming together in small pockets to inhabit a new way of being. And if a critical mass of us, imagine the kind of community that you are cultivating at Thrive. Imagine if you could multiply that. Imagine a critical mass of you, of us, showing up with that kind of bravery, holding fast to the vision of an America where we see no stranger. <laughs> guided by the ethic of love, I, that's what I'm here for. That's, that's what makes me want to last. In 25 years, I want to see us burden it instead of falling apart. You know, I, I want it to be the darkness of the womb for my son, for your daughter, when they come of age, instead of the darkness of the tomb. And I know that the labor will continue. There's no one point in history where the nation is born and it's perfect. And that's where the birthing metaphor is, has its limits, right? The labor's ongoing. But if I can show my children how to labor with love and therefore how to labor with joy, then I know that I will have done my part and then given them the tools to be resilient and show up for their their role in the labor to come. That's all we can ask, right? May it be so. May it be so. <laughs> and may we all go forth uh, practicing sweet labor and calling forth revolutionary love. Deep, deep, deep gratitude, Valerie. What a precious gift it's been to spend this time with you. Thank you for opening your heart. Thank you for your vulnerability, for your fierce wisdom, for your stand, for your presence, for your revolutionary love, for painting a path for all of us helping us frame what's possible in this moment.
Thank you. So you. I can only I can only be as present as those who are with me, and you are just with me in this beautiful sacred space. Thank you. Thank you for letting me inside. I hope we get much more, and I hope our babies get to know each other. Yes, please. <laughs> Let's make that happen. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And we have one more precious uh, treat in store. Brother Zoe is going to come back online and close us off as he opened us in beautiful song. Uh, lots of links coming in the chat. And for folks who registered, we will follow up with more information where you can learn more about uh, an incredible class that Valerie is going to be leading at Kripalu coming forth as well as her book and the, many other talks and uh, access to Zoe's incredible music as well. So with that, Zoe, I pass it to you. Wow. Uh, if we were in person, this is where I would say, let's have another huge round of applause for <laughs> Valerie Kaur and Shireen Badawi. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's, been, uh, it's been my turn to cry and uh, sweet tears of uh, joy and, and soul and inspiration. So uh, I, I, I'm just hearing everything you're saying and saying, yes, 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 yes. So this is to close us out. This is a song called May It Be. May It Be. May we return to the earth, kneel upon her holy ground. Atone unto her. May we remember and restore the sacred web that holds us like our ancestors before. Whoa, 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 whoa. May it be, may it be. Whoa, 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 whoa. May it be, may it be. May we return to our neighbor with hands upon our heavy hearts for all the days of war. And find the strength to right our wrongs till every child is lifted up and every tribe is home. Whoa, 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 may it be, may it be, whoa, 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 whoa. may it be, may it be, though we have strayed from love's way. It's not too late to come back home. Though we strayed from love's way, it's not too late to come back home. Come back home. May we return to the heart, the answer underneath it all, where every journey starts. And may we cast the rest aside, till all we have is who we are, the mystery inside. Whoa, 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 may it be. May it be whoa, 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 whoa. May it be May it be whoa, 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 whoa. May it be May it be whoa, whoa. May it be. May it be. Thank you, Zoe. For Thank that you. Prayer song. 
Valerie, last word goes to you. <sighs> mm. I want to close with my grandfather's prayer. Tati vana lagi pad bram shanai joge dhamare ram ka dukh lage na pai satgur pura petya jin pant banahi ram naam okhdiya ek kal vlahi rak le otin rakan had sab yaad mitai ko nane kirpa pe prape sahai vai kri ji ka khalsa vai kri ji ki fate The hot winds cannot touch you. You are shielded by love. Thank you, Valerie. Deepest gratitude. I want to invite folks in the chat to just share your love, appreciation, insights, heart openings with Valerie. Yeah. And uh, we'll follow up with many more resources and hope that we stay connected. Trust we will stay connected. Much love, many blessings to all. <laughs> Valerie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I just want to be with you both forever. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have babies to feed and <laughs> like, can I just stay here? <laughs> it was such a beautiful conversation. I feel so moved. So, so grateful. Uh, there's a recording and we'll share it. And yeah, I hope that we can stay woven in whatever way makes sense. You have a home in the Bay. I'm sure you have many homes in the Bay, but you have another one. <laughs> and in New Hampshire, if you ever come out this way. That's where you are in New Hampshire. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of um, questions in the chat that I wasn't tracking because I was just like so in it with you, but. There's so much love and appreciation for the medicine that you offer in these times. And yeah, grateful. There's, I, it's very rare when I feel like I have truly received more than I gave. So, so thank you so much for the music and the alchemy. And you let me know if you ever record it and please let's be in touch. If you want to play that song again and the stuff that we do in the future, it would be so amazing. And Shireen, I just, I just, just loved being in conversation with you. Just so, so present, so dropped in, so inside of it all with me. I, it was, it was, um, it was like you we were in, like, I was like, come sit in my heart. Let's talk in my heart. That's how it felt. <laughs> yes. So thank you. Thank you. And thank your husband and thank your babies and yeah. I just I, love, 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 revolutionary love, love, love. <laughs> I know at this point, if we were if we were in person, we'd be like, we would each other. Love each other. Each other. <laughs> after having some, you know, ice cream, as we take a yeah. walk down the block, and oh, maybe that happen in the future. Yeah, and may this conversation be in service to more revolutionary love. I think it will be. It already has been for me. I'm such a fan for all for, for more self love, more loving of others, and certainly more loving of my opponent. I feel more brave after talking with you. <laughs>